Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2016 Richard Rodino Lecture on the Aims of the Liberal Arts. If you take a look at the back of your program, you will see that this lecture has been going on since 1996. And it's been a wonderful way for us to celebrate the education that we offer at Holy Cross and to honor a former colleague, Richard Rodino. Rich was only at Holy Cross for 11 years and still managed to have a significant impact on the college. An excellent teacher and a gifted scholar, he was also a creative administrator, contributing significantly to the College Honors Program, the Fenwick Scholars Program, and the First Year Program. So it is fitting that we gather each year to explore the aims of the liberal arts in his honor. I am delighted that Professor James Key of the Department of English, a friend and colleague of Rich Rodino, has agreed to deliver this address on the 20th anniversary of the first lecture. But I must confess, I tried to get someone else to do this introduction. I even tried to convince Frank Velaccio, who is in Florida right now, that he could video record it, and I would project him onto the big screen up here. I know that's a scary thought. I wasn't avoiding it because I don't deeply respect Jim Key and what he has meant to this college and to many of us in this room, it was because I worry about how I might do justice to all Jim has meant to this college and to many of us in this room. We could go through the litany of positions he has held. Director of the Honors Program, Department Chair, Ombudsperson, Associate Dean of the College, Acting Dean, Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs. I could list some of the committees he has served on the CTP, the FPC, Research and Pub, Academic Standing, Faculty Affairs, Special Studies, Committee on Mission, Committee on the Evaluation of Teaching, Strategic Planning Committees, and Presidential Task Forces. We could talk about the faculty he has hired, many sitting in this room, both in his administrative roles and through his participation on search committees, in English, and also in music and visual arts. We could talk about the students he has mentored, offering tutorials and directing honors theses on topics such as hermeneutics and history, tragedy and transcendence, self and divine, philosophy and poetry, or Milton, Plato, and the search for the good life. Or we might consider the courses he has taught, Chaucer, The Tragic View, Readings in Medieval Literature, Craw, Ways of Knowing, Thinking, Seeing, and Believing, Contemporary Literary Theory, and a wide variety of Montserrat seminars. We could talk about the scholarly work he has done on Northrop Fry or his explorations of Chaucer, Langland, and Milton. But if we each take a moment to think about our own experience of Jim, our own engagement with him, in conversations about philosophy or literature, about mission or the liberal arts, about students and teaching, about what it means to be a teacher scholar at a strictly undergraduate Jesuit Catholic liberal arts college, we know that there is much more to say to do justice to all that Jim has meant to this college and to many of us in this room. We might say, as his former students did, quote, there is nothing more powerful than sitting in a classroom and listening to Professor Key read a text. Or, quote, I have learned a great deal from his significant wealth of knowledge, but have learned so much more from the wisdom which underlies that knowledge. Or, quote, Professor Key's own drive and desire to see to the heart of the matter of life and to live the fundamental questions of our existence has spurred my own. Through my experiences with Professor Key, I have caught a glimpse of a wisdom that I hope will someday underlie my own actions and thought. We might say, as his colleagues have, 
quote, on many occasions I have been blown away by the breadth and depth of his knowledge. Beyond Jim's considerable knowledge, however, there is his passionate engagement and feel for what's at stake in encountering literary texts, especially poetry. There is nothing self-promoting or self-congratulatory about Jim's learnedness. He is humbled, as students readily perceive, before the material he loves and reveres. Or, quote, Jim has been a valuable mentor to me since I came to Holy Cross. When I am planning something new for an upcoming class or reflecting on what happened in class that day, a conversation with Jim is not only enjoyable, but stimulating and terrifically useful. But what I value most is not only Jim's unassuming but undeniable brilliance, it is also his open mind and intellectual curiosity. Or finally, quote, Students who learn with a good teacher, that is, teachers who themselves learn in class preparation and in the class itself, begin over their four years at Holy Cross to see the complexity of the relationship between life and art. They grasp, without knowing it, the moral character of learning. They develop a literary imagination that takes them out into the world with somewhat less concern for themselves and somewhat more concern for their obligations to others. Professor Jim Key's students have been blessed to learn with a very good teacher. When we think of what is most significant about Holy Cross, we naturally turn to the college's mission statement a statement that Jim had a large role in drafting. Quote, to participate in the life of Holy Cross is to accept an invitation to join in a dialogue about basic human questions, to be challenged to be open to new ideas, to be patient with ambiguity and uncertainty, to combine a passion for truth with respect for the views of others. For 35 years, Jim Key has accepted that invitation and in turn extended it to his students and colleagues. This is his immeasurable gift to all of us and to his students. He models what is best about Holy Cross and welcomes us all to join him in our shared endeavor. Colleagues, it is my pleasure to present Professor James Key to give his address waiting on insight. Jim. Well, thank you, Margaret, for that deeply moving introduction, uh, that, that great work of fiction that uh, you put together there. <laughs> And thank you for inviting me to deliver this year's Rodino Lecture. Um, I want to thank each of you for coming today as well. I'm honored to join the company of colleagues who have this, delivered this lecture in past years. And I'm especially pleased to have this opportunity, as Margaret said, because Richard Rodino was a colleague of mine and a close friend um, during my first eight and a half years at Holy Cross. That is before his sudden untimely death from a heart attack just over 25 years ago. 25 year anniversary was December 30th of the past year. He was only 14, four, uh, yeah, 14. He was only 41 at the time. Um, I'd like to begin with a brief personal remembrance of Rich. We honor his memory with this lecture because he was passionately involved in so many discussions about the nature of liberal education at Holy Cross. Whether this involved topics like special studies, common area requirements, or the shape of the English major. At the time of his death, he was co-chairing a committee that was working to develop a first year program. Before that, he had taken on the college's honors program at a time when its appeal among students had waned considerably, and he transformed it into the vital program that it still is today. He directed numerous honors theses and more than one Fenwick Scholar project. He was a much sought after teacher who worked incredibly hard at his courses, and he was an energetic conversation partner with his colleagues about pedagogical matters. At the time of his death, he was working on a book on Jonathan Swift. 
He had indeed already established himself as a promising young Swift scholar, so much so that to this day, the University of Münster in Germany honors young Swift scholars with an award that's named for Rich. Rich was co-author of four successful mystery novels under the name of Richard Hillary, and he was in negotiations for a possible series of movies based on the novels. All this, and he was a gentleman farmer. He and his wife, Denise, owned a 38-acre farm in North Brookfield, on which he grew a full array of crops and raised livestock. My family and I were privileged to share several meals with the Rodinos, at which he served everything that was grown or everything that was served was grown or raised on his farm. Even when Rich was alive, his friends marveled at how many and varied his activities and accomplishments were, and the passion with which he pursued all of them. After he was gone, we could not help but think that he had lived intensely out of an intimation of his early death. I hope my address this afternoon will be in the spirit of Richard Rodino's passionate concern for liberal arts at Holy Cross. All of us here know that the liberal arts today are under pressure to justify themselves. They always are, perhaps, but today more so than usual. I'm in no position to address all of the challenges that we face, but I will attempt to address some of them by developing a two-part argument one with very specific focus and one with a more general set of concerns. For my presentation, for most of it, I will describe how the goals of liberal education look from the perspective of my work here as a teacher and scholar of literature. Then, more briefly and in conclusion, I will outline, excuse me, I will outline a framework within which all of us, regardless of our disciplinary focus, might engage in ongoing dialogue about our shared liberal arts mission. Such dialogue may not be possible at large multiversities, as I think most of our universities should be called. Um, it is essential, however, if a strictly undergraduate liberal arts college, especially one in the Catholic and Jesuit tradition, is to nurture its distinctive mission and identity. Let me begin by citing a passage from a late dialogue by Plato, the Philebus. At one point, Socrates puts forth the following likely story, an instance of what is called a philosopher's myth. Socrates says, there is a gift of the gods, or so at least it seems evident to me, which they let fall from their abode. And it was through Prometheus, or one like him, that it reached mankind, together with a fire exceeding bright. The men of old, who were better than ourselves and dwelt nearer to the gods, passed on this gift in the form of a saying. All things, so it ran, that are ever said to be, consist of a one and a many, and have in their nature a conjunction of limit and unlimitedness. The saying that Socrates recollects indicates that all of the things which emerge into being are in between realities. Their identities are constituted by two poles, oneness and unlimitedness. The pole of unlimitedness symbolizes the infinite realm of potential that lies in the depths of reality, the depths from which things emerge. The pole of oneness, in turn, symbolizes the formative intellectual presence at work within reality, a presence that gives any particular thing its identity, that makes it possible for any subject matter to emerge as a determinate matter for thought. Thinking participates in this happening of reality, in this formative process, when it responds to the appeal of the process in questioning wonder. A properly responsive thinking moves between these same two poles and avoids making one too quickly or, indeter or unlimited indeterminacy too quickly. By so responding to the formative intellectual presence of the one, thinking discovers limited forms that have determinate, if intermediate, identities. To shift to the concrete, the results of this historical process today are evident in the disciplines that are practiced within the academy. I will return to the matter of this myth's general significance for liberal education toward the end of my talk. First, let me take up my own practice as a teacher and scholar of literature as I understand it in the light of this myth. 
There are numerous different kinds of disciplined activities that take place within literature departments these days. I am no more competent to carry out some of them than I would be to practice theoretical physics. But I know something about interpreting literary texts. I was, it was particular experiences interpreting texts, texts like King Lear and a portrait of the artist as a young man that drew me into the study of literature when I was young. And despite the fact that many literary scholars have in recent decades raised questions about the nature and even the possibility of interpretation, I have continued to place interpretation at the center of my work. I have spent years trying to understand just what we do when we interpret text and what we experience that lies beyond our willing and our doing. I believe most especially that interpretation lies at the heart of the undergraduate study of literature. Most students who are drawn to major in English do so because they are seeking to make sense of their experience, and interpreting great literature is central to that effort. At the risk of uh, being like Mark Ruby, Mar uh, Marco Rubio, I'm going to take a sip of water. <laughs> Let me narrow my focus further with the help of a distinction that, despite its roughness, will, I hope, serve my purposes. I'm particularly drawn to the kind of literature that we might call visionary. Such literature does not primarily seek to represent reality as it is encountered in that in-between realm of Plato's myths. Okay, for example, the way a realistic novel does. It is rather concerned with articulating a vision of reality as a whole, with the mythic as such, we might say, since it is born of a consciousness that there is a beyond of this in-between. To paraphrase Hamlet's remark to Horatio, it concerns itself with the more in heaven and earth than is normally dreamt of in our disciplines. The Platonic myth that I quoted is itself an instance of such visionary literature. In coming to understand what's involved in creating and interpreting visionary literature, I'm especially indebted to contemporary hermeneutics, a tradition of reflection associated with names such as Martin Heidegger, Hans Georg Gadamer, Paul Ricoeur, and in its phenomenological aspects, Jean-Luc Marion. As has always been the case, hermeneutics is concerned with understanding. A successful effort of interpretation discloses lived experiences or possible forms of life or modes of being that texts articulate. Contemporary hermeneutics, however, as opposed to the Kantian-inspired hermeneutics of the earlier era, does not approach understanding as an epistemological matter, as a transition between a transaction between a subject and an object. Understanding is here conceived on analogy with the Aristotelian virtue called phrenesis rather than episteme, as a matter of practical insight and judgment. Thus, contemporary hermeneutics designates not a theory or a method. Okay, but a family of reflective insights that are intended to assist an interpretive effort. So conceived, hermeneutics attempts to respond to the irreducibly singular character of the phenomenon to be understood, as well as the particular historical situation in which the search for understanding takes place. It resists the temptation to construe all texts according to an a priori method of some sort. Let me highlight some of these practical insights in order to indicate what literary study focused on interpretation can contribute to liberal education. In his reflections on the origin of the work of art, Heidegger seeks to clear a space for encountering works of art on their own terms, on terms not predetermined by metaphysical categories that have sought to grasp works as objects present at hand. He argues that the work of art is one of the few essential ways in which truth happens, and that the work must be heard, not as a noun naming a thing, but as a verb to work that predicates an activity. He thereby calls attention to the fact that works of art must be carried out. There are two different ways in which to carry out a work of art, to create and to preserve. The latter term includes the work of interpretation, Intriguingly, Heidegger describes the activities of creating and preserving a work in almost identical language. Both involve a letting be, guided by the subject matter of the work, 
both the creator and the preserver make the work happen in a way that allows the subject matter to appear in its truth. Perhaps we can better imagine what is being said here if we imagine a work of music rather than a framed painting on a wall. The latter too readily leads us to think of the work as an object present at hand. The former clearly must happen as a performance. The work's mode of existence over time requires a preserver as much as a creator. The German verb translated as preserve here is bewahren, which is etymologically related to Wahrheit, the German for truth. One might say, therefore, that the interpreter's task is to keep faith with the truth of the work, to make it happen again in some new situation. Creating the work and interpreting it are thus parallel, complementary activities. Both are carried out in the service of disclosing some subject matter in its truth. Truth here is not conceived as the correspondence of a statement to some fact. More primordially, it refers to an event in which some subject matter is brought forth, unconcealed. In both creating and interpreting, the subject matter must lead. What I am calling the subject matter is usually thought of as a possible mode of existence or form of life or a way of finding oneself in the world. Moreover, in visionary literature of the sort that concerns me here, this bringing forth is not a representation of some subject matter that was already present. The subject matter that the work brings forth is one that otherwise would have remained hidden or concealed. These insights have taken as illuminating what happens when one successfully encounters a work of literature have consequences for how we understand both the language involved in interpreting and the character of the person who interprets. First of all, language here is not an instrument or tool of thought. It precedes thought, even if it ultimately serves thought. It is the medium to which we must submit if the subject matter of the work is to be brought forth. As such, language here is not fundamentally expressive of psychic states, nor is it fundamentally conceptual, taking hold of the work subject matter as scientific definitions take hold of their objects. We might think of it rather as indexical or symbolic. The classic example of an indexical sign is the smoke that indicates a fire. As indexical, the language of a literary work does not possess within itself the truth of its subject matter. Rather, it's thinking, it points thinking towards the subject's towards the work subject matter. It is evocative. It calls forth from the interpreter an imaginative response that would apprehend the work's subject matter in a fresh intuition. It requires that the interpreter's own language be a living language, responsive to the time and place in which the interpreter lives, in order that the act of interpretation might make the subject matter appear in a living way once more. We might also think of the work's language as fundamentally symbolic. Gadamer has described the character of a symbol in terms that prove helpful here. He writes, quote, the symbolic in general, and especially the symbolic in art, rests upon an intricate interplay of showing and concealing. Symbol was originally a technical term in Greek for a token of remembrance. Hosts presented a guest with a token of hospitality by breaking some object in two. The host would keep one half for themselves and give the other half to the guest. If in time, a descendant of the guest should ever return, the two pieces could be fitted together again to form a whole in an act of recognition. In its original technical sense then, a symbol represented something in and through which we recognize something already known to us. For our experience of the symbolic in general, some concrete particular represents a fragment that promises to complete and make whole whatever corresponds to it. In experiences of the beautiful, and especially the beautiful in art, symbol invokes a potentially whole and perhaps even holy order of things wherever it may be found. Functioning symbolically, Visionary literature evokes recognition of possible modes of being in the world. 
In order to make this claim more concretely, let me return to the visionary work that I have already cited, the Platonic myth from the Philebus. That myth outlines the in-between realm of limited intermediate forms that concern our scientific disciplines. Science here meant broadly in the sense of German Wissenschaft, um, roughly synonymous, that is, with disciplinary practices at large. But the myth also symbolizes and thereby points to a beyond of that in-between realm in the figures of the one and the unlimited. It thereby makes us conscious of dimensions of reality that lie beyond our capacity to objectify phenomena and grasp them conceptually. Interpreters of visionary literature are not fundamentally, excuse me, are not fundamentally subjects standing over against objects of inquiry. The work of interpretation, therefore, at its most basic, is not a matter of critical thinking. To be sure, there is a place for critical thinking in developing insights and correcting oversights that emerge in the course of an interpretive effort. Paul Ricoeur is especially good at delineating this phase of the process. But my concern here, the concern that gave rise to the title of my address, is for what, remain conceals in, what remains concealed in our intellectual activities when we only talk of critical thinking. If interpreters of a visionary work of literature are to enable the work again to disclose its subject matter, they must first be openly attentive and receptive not detached and suspicious. They must be willing to let the work's language affect them evocatively. This involves, to be sure, paying scrupulous attention to the syntax and semantics of the work's language, to the generative grammar that is its genre, to the traditions in which it stands in relation, and to the interpretive efforts of others. But it also involves the serious play of a disciplined imagination one that is assertive in coming up with possible notions about the work's wholeness, but not willfully aggressive in a manner that would seize the work and make it serve one's own purposes. This imaginative play must always seek to keep faith with the truth of the work, and that often requires patience, attentive waiting on insight. As my deceased colleague John Wilson used to put it, we must learn not just to question the work, but to allow it to question us. If the visionary aspects of a literary work point towards some sense of the whole, then the interpreter's relation to the whole must be considered. It is not that of a Cartesian cogito, a subject of cognition facing a phenomenon that can be constituted as an object. As embodied mortals, we are more primordially participants in the whole, the whole being what Plato symbolizes as that process in which things mysteriously emerge into presence and just as mysteriously perish. As participants who do not know our whence and our whither, we must keep our fundamental ignorance in mind and from the start be attentively open to the intuitions given us in experience. Before we try to speak, we must listen and hear. Jean-Luc Marion argues that when we are open to phenomena as the sheer givens of experience, we recognize these phenomena as gifts and ourselves as gifted. Gifted here translates the French word la donnée. It means not a person of peculiar <coughs> genius, as the idiom of English translation might first suggest. Rather, it names us as the one to whom the given is given. As participants in the process of reality, we have intimations of a wholeness in reality, but we cannot, rep we cannot represent that wholeness. We cannot make it fully present. What creative writers can do, however, in a responsive attempt to make sense of experience is to articulate a symbolic vision of a world and a possible mode of being <coughs> within it. This symbolic vision rests, as I said earlier, on an interplay of showing and concealing and functions indexically. <coughs> Interpreters, in turn, respond to the vision's evocative character and seek to apprehend imaginatively the possible mode of being proposed by the work. They then, in turn, so they then in turn work to articulate the meaning of that vision in the kind of living language that can make the work happen again, that can preserve it, that keeps faith with its truth. In teaching my courses, I have typically not studied hermeneutic philosophy directly with my students. 
Yet these reflections on interpretation have always tacitly informed my teaching. In most courses, I have found literary works that can stand as parables of hermeneutic experience. Um, and I use these rather than the philosophical texts themselves. That is to say, we interpret them as we would any work, but we also take advantage of their reflective character, um, how they illustrate what's at stake in interpretation. In order to illustrate what I've been talking about, let me discuss three of these hermeneutic parables. The first is a wonderful short story by Gabriel Garcia Marquez entitled, The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World. It is subtitled, A Tale for Children. And indeed, it is a simple narrative made up of a linear sequence of episodes. The nature of its conflict, however, and the way the conflict gets resolved profoundly illuminate the stakes in hermeneutic experience. The sign to be interpreted in this story is the drowned man himself. He washes up on the shore of a village. He is covered with seaweed, and jellyfish tentacles, and other kinds of ocean flotsam. The children, who are the first to find him, initially think he's a ship and then a whale. When they remove the coverings from him, however, they see he is a drowned man. They spend the afternoon playing with him, repeatedly burying him in the sand and then digging him up. When the men of the village hear about the drowned man, they carry him to the nearest house. He proves to be the tallest and heaviest man they had ever seen. And they remark that there was, quote, barely enough room for him in the house. They worry what to do with him. Their village has little land in which to bury the dead. So they travel to other villages to see if he might be from one of those. The women in the village are left to clean the body. They look at him closely and notice from the vegetation on him that he must have come from far away. They notice, too, that he bore his death with pride, unlike other drowned men that they had seen. By the time they finished cleaning him, he appeared to be, quote, the tallest, strongest, most virile, and best built man they had ever seen. He was more than they could make sense of, or as the narrator puts it, there was no room for him in their imagination. As the women continue to tend to the drowned man, some start to fantasize about what he must have been like when he was alive. They compare him to their own men and conclude that their men were, quote, the weakest, meanest, and most useless creatures on the face of the earth. But then comes the first of the two major turning points in the story. The oldest among them, who as the oldest had looked upon the drowned man with more compassion than passion, suddenly sighed, he has the face of someone called Esteban. The others looked at the man and concluded it was true. He now has a name, and it could not have been any other name. With compassion enlarging their imaginations, they soon understand how unhappy Esteban must have been having to carry around that huge body in life. Eventually, quote, the first furrows of tears opened in their hearts, and they respectfully cover his face with a handkerchief. When the men return with the news that the drowned man was not from any of the neighboring villages, the women exclaim, praise the Lord, he's ours. The men, however, continue to see only a bothersome mass that they somehow have to get rid of. When the women keep trying to delay their efforts at disposal, the men eventually explode and say, since when has there been such a fuss over a drifting corpse, a drowned nobody, a piece of cold Wednesday meat? But then comes the second major turning point. One of the women, so mortified by the language that she has heard, suddenly removes the handkerchief from the dead man's face. The men are made to look at the face. They, too, are left breathless. They, too, see that he was indeed Esteban. With the conflicts resolved, all the men and women of the village proceed to carry out the grandest funeral rite ever. Not wanting to return Esteban to the waters as an orphan, they choose a father and a mother for him, and aunts and uncles and cousins. All the villagers thereby become his kinsmen. They also become aware that before Esteban's arrival, their streets had been desolate, their courtyards dry, their dreams narrow. Now that they had made Esteban theirs, however, they knew that in the future, everything would be different. Their houses would have wider doors and higher ceilings and stronger floors so, when fate, excuse me, so that Esteban's memory could go everywhere without pain or embarrassment. 
in some, when faced with a bothersome unknown that had intruded into their everyday lives, their imaginations, fueled by compassion, had enlarged their consciousness and transformed their world. I've made similar use of Shakespeare's Hamlet as a parabolic work, and let me talk about that for a few minutes. To do so, I first have to disabuse students of the idea that the essence of the play lies in Hamlet's so-called tragic flaw or indecisiveness. Although the play as we have it in the modern editions is very long, and it takes Hamlet a long time to act, the fundamental problem is not that Hamlet is a man who cannot make up his mind. We have to ask first about the world of the play and of Hamlet's relationship to it. Hamlet is a brilliant exploration of a tragic underside of the modern epoch, its will to power. The title character is a modern man who finds himself thrown into a world where no appearance can be trusted. Anxiety about appearances permeate the play from the outset. The first words spoken in fear are, who's there? Indeed, the appearances with which the centuries of Denmark wrestle include a ghost, always the kind of figure that threatens one's sense of reality with madness. How is one to avoid being deceived? How is one to get at the truth about the present state affairs of affairs? The problem is sufficiently acute that a voice of common sense eventually acknowledges something's rotten in the state of Denmark. The characters in this world are preoccupied with willful attempts to advance their own interests by projecting and manipulating appearances. Sound familiar? They present themselves in calculated ways that conceal their real intentions and interests. They speak not because they have heard a truth that must be spoken, but in order to advance their secret projects. Consider the main lines of action that unfold in the second and third acts. The king, who is obviously an accomplished manipulator of appearances, becomes suspicious about Hamlet's motives. He plots with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on the one hand and Polonius on the other, to try and find out the reasons for Hamlet's apparent madness. Polonius, for his part, concocts a script for Rinaldo in order to determine just what his son, Polonius' son Laertes, is up to in Paris. When Hamlet does hatch a plan to take up the charge placed upon him by the ghost of his dead father, he puts on an antic disposition, hoping to set the time right. This strategy, however, traps Hamlet within the very rottenness from which he is supposed to deliver Denmark. Think of the consequences that flow from his actions in the first four acts. He not only proves ineffective in setting the time aright, he inflicts his own monstrous injustices upon the world. In mistaking Polonius for Claudius, he kills the four real fool and burdens Laertes with the need to revenge his father's death. In determination to grope the conscience of his mother, he speaks verbal daggers to, be her that, to her that almost drive her to despair. Indeed, he has to be stopped by the ghost of his father from this unholy attempt to play a priest-like role, to be kind by being cruel. Most painfully of all, he drives the woman he loves to commit suicide. He is, we must conclude, both alienated from the world of Denmark and trapped within its rottenness. Indeed, his disgust with his father's murder and his mother's sexuality has left him alienated from the most basic conditions of human existence, becoming and perishing, life and death, eros and thanatos. As Hamlet is sent off to England, it is hard to see how he is going to turn into the tragic hero that this rotten world so desperately needs for its deliverance. And yet he does become that hero when he alters his fundamental relationship to the world. While away from England and then upon his return, Hamlet twice encounters death concretely. The first involves a miraculous escape from his own death. The second, his encounter with the gravedigger. After accidents of fortune have intervened to upset the king's plot to have Hamlet killed, Hamlet reflects upon his escape and recognizes that our indiscretions sometimes serve us well when our deep plots do fail that a divinity shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. In the first act of scene five, the gravedigger draws Hamlet into a meditation on human mortality. The meditation helps Hamlet to come to terms with death as belonging to everyone's existence, inherently a part of life. As a result of these experiences, 
Death seeks to be one of the great titans that disgusts Hamlet. He opens himself to it, lets its cathartic powers flow into his soul, recognizes it as inherent in the very gift of being. And when he does so, death brings a measure of order to his soul. Death, that is, begins to restore Hamlet to life. It strips him of what is ignoble and unjust and allows only what is essential to remain. It enables him to discern directional indices towards the good, indices that had been concealed by Denmark's rottenness. So when Hamlet is confronted with the latest plot cooked up by Claudius, he simply agrees to take part. Horatio, suspicious of the king, urges Hamlet to examine the proposal critically. But for once, Hamlet does not act on suspicions. He responds, we defy augury. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Let be. The forces of death and chance have opened Hamlet's soul to human finitude, to the limits of his will to power. Thus opened, he develops a transformed relationship to time. No longer does he take it upon himself, the burden of setting the time aright. He has learned rather simply to keep time. Willingness has replaced willfulness. By doing so, he becomes a partner to the divinity at work in time, the one whose special providence acts through him to restore a measure of order. His mission of revenge is finally carried out. The locus of the treachery responsible for Denmark's rottenness is disclosed, and the purposes mistook fall upon the inventor's head. A third parabolic work I like to cite is a short lyric by Wallace Stevens entitled Angels Surrounded by Paisans. Read as a parable of hermeneutic experience, this poem develops the angel of its title into a symbol for the visionary poetic symbol as such. The poem has a dramatic structure. The first speaker is one of the paisans or countrymen, and he simply asks the question, there is a welcome at the door to which no one comes? The question suggests that the countrymen are hospitable folk, open and attentively waiting for any visitor who might arrive. But no such figure seems to be present. The angel responds immediately, however, suggesting that he is indeed there, but that the countrymen have not recognized him. The first part of his response, excuse me, in the first part of his response, the angel demystifies himself for them, seeking to remove cliched notions about angelic messengers that may be impeding their vision. But then he utters the word yet, and for the rest of the poem, he discloses to them why he is the necessary angel. Angel surrounded by paisans, one of the countrymen. There is a welcome at the door to which no one comes, the angel. I am the angel of reality, seen for a moment standing in the door. I have neither ash and wing nor wear of oar, and live without a tepid aureole or stars that follow me, not to attend but of my being and its knowing part. I am one of you, and being one of you is being and knowing what I am and know. Yet I am the necessary angel of earth, since in my sight you see the earth again, cleared of its stiff and stubborn manlock set. And in my hearing, you hear its tragic drone rise liquidly in liquid lingerings like watery words awash like meanings said by repetitions of half meanings. Am I not myself only half of a figure of a sort, a figure half seen or seen for a moment, a man of the mind, an apparition apparelled in apparels of such lightest look that a turn of my shoulder and quickly, too quickly, I am gone? A reflective understanding of hermeneutic experience calls upon us to labor like the countrymen, to become ever more open, attentive, and hospitable to that which would appear in the course of engagement with a work. It is a source of wonder, really, that when we do manage to achieve such welcoming attitude, the necessary angel so often does appear, and we see and hear the earth afresh, cleared of its stiff and stubborn manlock prejudices. 
By way of conclusion, let me briefly take up the second topic that I mentioned at the start of my presentation and suggest a framework within which all of us, regardless of our disciplinary focus, might engage in ongoing dialogue about our shared liberal arts mission. There is a tension, to be sure, between interpretive practices as I've been describing them and the impetus towards scientific certainty that operates in many of our disciplines. Now, there are things, limited intermediate forms in Plato's language, about which we can and should seek secure, if not certain, knowledge. But I've been concerned here to focus on matters that tend to withdraw from us when we seek certainty about them. I've been talking about a quest for understanding that may be at odds, finally, with an unrestricted desire for certainty. Gadamer introduces the fundamental task faced by hermeneutics today in terms that indicate the nature of the problem. The central question of the modern age is a question posed for us by the existence of modern science. It is a question of how our natural view of the world, the experience of the world that we have as we simply live out our lives, is related to the authority that confronts us in the pronouncements of science. The hermeneutic task, he continues, is to reconnect the objective world of technology, which the sciences place at our disposal and discretion, with those fundamental orders of our being that are neither arbitrary nor manipulable by us, but rather simply demand our acknowledgement and respect. The vision offered by Plato's myth suggests a way beyond any mere opposition between the sciences and the humanities, between the Naturwissenschaften and the Geisteswissenschaften, if you will. Any of the disciplines we might practice occupy a region in that in-between realm where multiple subject matters have emerged and taken on a measure of determinant form. This is so whether the discipline in question belongs to the sciences, the humanities, or the arts. Within this realm, disciplines come to exercise a degree of relative autonomy. I say relative autonomy, however, because the intermediate forms that concern us as inquirers cannot be exhaustively grasped by any of the message we, methods we might, use of, um, we might make use of in order to objectify them. In concluding his presentation of the myth, Socrates warns that, quote, your clever modern man, while making his one, or his many, as the case may be, more quickly or more slowly than is proper for the subject matter, allows the intermediates to escape him, whereas it is the recognition of those intermediates that makes all the difference between a properly scientific discussion and an ideologically contentious one. Even in this age of specialization, then, we need genuine dialogue, conversation that begins when we become conscious of the limits that condition our disciplinary perspectives. The need for dialogue, the myth indicates, is rooted in the very nature of being and thinking. Moreover, such dialogue, genuinely engaged in, harbors the capacity to bring concrete communities, genuine collegiality, into being. The logos that makes for real intellectual communities can only emerge in dialogue. It cannot emerge from parallel monologues carried on by subjects who make disciplinary autonomy absolute. Such dialogue leads to the emergence and recognition of new intermediate forms. Perhaps more importantly, it leads us to become conscious of the process of reality as a whole in which we all participate. I would be remiss if I did not conclude by addressing briefly the distinctive charism of the College of the Holy Cross, its Catholic and Jesuit character. Thinking about the aims of the liberal arts with the help of Plato's myth also suggests some ways of imagining the form that an undergraduate liberal arts college in the Catholic and Jesuit tradition might take today. As institutions that have emerged historically, both the church and the academy belong to the in-between realm delineated in Plato's vision. As such, dialogue between them is natural and necessary. Let me propose that we imagine Holy Cross to have a liminal character. That is to say, it stands in a threshold between two living traditions. One is Catholic and Jesuit, the other is the American Academy. As a liminal institution, Holy Cross serves the life of the church by being engaged with the best insights that the contemporary academy has to offer. 
Such engagement is essential for a tradition of faith that is seeking ever deeper understanding of reality in light of divine revelation. It fosters the development of doctrine, and doctrine must develop it is, if it is to be heard in diverse, ever-changing historical circumstances. Paradoxically, to remain the same, doctrine must be refigured again and again. The church's dialogue with secular disciplines of the academy has already contributed substantially to that effort. It has been argued persuasively, I think, that the 20th century may prove to be the most fertile and productive century for Roman Catholic theology since the 13th. At the beginning of the century, theology was retreating on multiple fronts. Catholics were refusing to engage such modern developments as the historical critical study of the scriptures. By the end of the century, such obstacles had largely been overcome. Theology had opened itself to a whole array of modern intellectual developments without simply casting off its traditions and had renewed itself thereby. At the beginning of that same 20th century, the academy, for its part, seemed to be growing more and more secure in its conviction that an epoch of science had succeeded those of religion and metaphysics. Scientific ideologies such as positivism exercised pervasive influence. By mid-century, many scholars were confidently putting forth versions of a secularization thesis. From within the sciences themselves, however, developments were also taking place that made the supposedly secure foundations of scientific inquiry questionable. By the latter part of the century, secularization theses were being questioned even within the disciplines that had advanced them. Still, as the century ended, some distinguished sciences were, scientists were gaining notoriety as strident prophets of a new atheism. Despite such signs of intellectual turmoil, the dominant modes of thought in the academy remained skeptical about the meaning and truth of religious language. Let me risk suggesting, therefore, that the academy's secular intellectual traditions would benefit from a more sustained engagement with the world's religious and philosophical traditions. My point here is not to argue that the secular disciplines should be drawn into some sort of dogmatically religious superstructure. They would maintain their relative autonomy. But in terms of the contributions each can make to the common good of global society, they would benefit from stepping back, from becoming more conscious of the presuppositions that limit their perspectives, from gaining an intimation of the whole and of the horizon of mystery that belongs to it. If these suggestions have any measure of validity, the academy and the church really do need each other in order to sustain a genuine quest for understanding and serve the common good. Holy Cross, as an institution standing in a threshold between them, can and should play a role in facilitating their life-giving, life-affirming dialogue. Thank you.
a sense that giving an answer to that would require my ability to step out of that in between and take on that kind of you know perspective from outside reality on the whole thing. Um, and, and that obviously I can't do. Uh, you know, I, I think um, in some ways I see us in a situation on a number of fronts that is, that is accurately reflected by your comments that's more desperate and more in need of revolution. Um, and yet on a number of fronts, I, I, what, it's, what, the, what situations are making me think of is how, how difficult and how fragile it has been to develop institutions that have a mode of stability and that do good work and that keep going on. So my general tendency is not to look for um, revolution because I'm not sure that a revolutionary change can do anything except incite, you know, resistance. Where there's really there's really a need for a kind of um, you know slow, patient expanding of of horizons. There, you know, people have to experience concretely the moments when um, what they thought was the case, you know, suddenly appears as more complicated. Um, you know, it's what John Wilson. My own inclination is to say, what's that kind of patient work? Because Jane Chat, you look at it, you know, looking at the past, as I was saying, the last hundred years within um, Catholic intellectual life has been remarkable. So, I, that, that's a halting response to the question. Yes? me that uh, uh, the hermeneutics that you put before us is very much a, it's a hermeneutics of love. It's, 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 it's a, uh, and, and it's openness that towards a meaning that is, 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 is there, embedded, and we can keep awakening it, keep reviving it, and uh, uh, we, can, we can preserve it by virtue of our creative response to it. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that uh, we also have to acknowledge the need for this revival, which is a kind of awakening from the dead. Mm -hmm. you know? And that that, I think, requires that the hermeneutics of love be, be supplemented by a hermeneutics of suspicion. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we can be suspicious of is uh, uh, that uh, uh, it's, it's hard to get as far as Hamlet got. It's hard to get that far because we're afraid of death, right? And yet uh, uh, Esteban, as you put him before us, uh, he, 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 he bears on his face. I mean, the beauty he bears is uh, the courage with which he went into his death. And uh, so if we're going to make the recovery, we have to reach that deep. And that seems to me to, uh, uh, to come coupled with an acknowledgement that our institutions, uh, uh, beyond simply preserving the symbols that uh, make life meaningful, that our institutions themselves are in flight from that. And in a sense, always already doing what you suggested that uh, 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 a positivistic scientism at its worst tends to do. I can't really argue with anything that you said there. There's no question uh, that I think the problem is as deep as you indicated it is. And, um, you know, certainly, I, I, I mean, as most of you know, I'm, I'm ready to retire from Holy Cross at this point in time. And uh, this was a wonderful occasion for me not just to try to write um, an address uh, in response to Margaret's kind invitation, but also to think back on what it has meant to me to be here for 35 years and how, how nurtured I've been. But, you know, 
in some ways, what's sinking into forgetfulness are the frustrations I had with, <laughs> with times when I thought we had opportunities to be bolder in what we were going to do and didn't take them. Um, and, and I guess, you know, if we were to talk about it at the institutional level, um, you know, the, the schools like Holy Cross and Notre Dame that have begun to achieve a level of, uh, of security, relatively speaking, within the economic order, um, these have to be the places that that, uh, that take these chances and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the situation that uh, leadership has in, in not wanting to destroy the institution while trying to do some of these things. But, but frankly, you know, it's a question of do we really have faith in the gospel that we proclaim? Or, or when it comes down to really important decisions, do we draw back a little from that and perhaps not as good people of faith as we could? And I don't say that much. A desire to keep fingers at anybody. Yeah. This is really about Holy Cross's institutional history. I came here in the fall of 1989, and a couple of years after that, I can't remember exactly when we voted in, we actually voted in a change in our formal language to require a square analysis of year two semesters, which indicates for many students they might actually start a new language. Um, they might have taken French in high school and they decide to explore Chinese. So that yields an institution that can't guarantee any degree of depth in a language outside of the student's home language, in many cases outside England. I, in my own work with Indonesian literatures, try to do this sort of deep engagement with the text and this open mind, this generous hearted engagement with the work mm -hmm. as, as art. But to do that, I had to spend years becoming fluent in Indonesian, and on top of that, becoming fluent in the Sumatran language, and on top of that, becoming fluent in the ritual level of that mm -hmm. Sumatran language. So I think Holy Cross has kind of boxed itself in in terms of maybe not being able to help our students do this deep engagement with many literary texts that are outside their own mm -hmm. home language. So I'm going to give yeah, I well, love that. You know that the whole history, as I remember it, of that debate about requirements, the language requirement, um, you know, indicates concretely some of the problems. And, and uh, you know, our colleague Maurice Jarosh, when he gave this lecture a couple of years ago, in fact, had a major focus on this because as the as the person who did so much to establish uh, the study abroad program that we have, um, and as uh, somebody who was a fluent speaker of English as a second language, uh, he was. He was very sympathetic to what you're saying there. Um, and yet I think the proposals and the initiative in some ways came from the people at Holy Cross who had to teach the language. <laughs> if the members of the language department that are here might back me up on that. You know, and, and they had cogent regions for doing that. You know? And so um, you know, it, in some ways, the, the fact that we're not a place with a lot of graduate students who teach those elementary and secondary ones That those, the, the question reminds me of the difficulties that the administrators have that we're struggling with the administration. There's, there's, there's certainly an ideal there that you want to, nobody can speak against it. The desire of, of having, you know, one language that isn't your native language be something that really functions really through um, the Bob? I think this is you studied three texts that you called uh, parables. Parables, yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's so much that's written today that is not worth reading. Um, <laughs> first of all, can people agree on what text was parabolic, or need that need they agree? And sure. You seem to say you have to spend time with the text, you have to be patient, and so forth. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is where, for me, the, I, I, would, I would defend the notion of a distinction between literature in general and great literature. Um, but I, that doesn't mean that I have a canonical list that I would you know, immediately uh, point to or something like that. I think, it's a, I think it emerges from over time, from you know, the communities that engage it and can talk persuasively about them. And, uh, you know, for me, the definition of a classic, which is a, a word that I'd like to hold on to, is a text that has been able to move into um, a variety of different times and places over a long period of time and prove to have that disclosive capacity again and again. So it's not an unhistorical definition of, of, uh, of a classic. Um, 
I hope those three that I mentioned will. Two of them, one of them clearly is classic. You know? <laughs> uh, the great thing about the Mar Garcia Marquez story is you can do that early in a crawl course. Uh, you know, it has such a wonderfully simple narrative, and yet the vision that it put forward is, is in some ways as profound as anything I can teach in crawl courses. You know? We just read that. Uh -huh. Past couple of weeks, yeah. to the 300 level students, mm -hmm. and it was very interesting in Spanish. Yeah. They would, they would just say, "What? What is this guy doing here? What's this big man yeah. doing?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was there, playing with the dead person, and it, it took them a little while, and, yeah. and, and it, it, you almost had to teach it with another. Story, right. The, angel, the, man with the very old man with enormous wings. wings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I always do teach them together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Reacting to Esteban, who in, in Esteban, the name and the Christian, uh, it's a, you know, uh -huh. look up the name. It's, it's a Christian uh, mark. Mm -hmm. So that united yeah. the town. And, uh, so there was there was that. But eventually they they get it. And yeah. That, that whole ambiguity. How am I? What am I supposed to do right. with this? But it's a beautiful form to it, put here and to teach at the lower level. It was it was in timing the talk and trying to keep it, you know, in the neighborhood of fifty minutes that I eliminated a discussion. It's precisely the inability to have any compassion and to allow one's imagination to uh, emerge that, that that story. And just know, can, can I at the follow up yeah. with thing Garcia Marcus there's a lot of people that interpret within the work. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's the actual yeah. interpretation within the work, a little literary work. Now how how do you see that uh, activity of interpretation connect to let's say your general talk? Yeah, oh, I think that's when I my definition of a parable is a text that includes some of that kind of reflective awareness that we're or a big part of the the action that's unfolding is is it has to do with you know how do we make sense of this phenomenon? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly within the work itself. So you know I don't have to in class th third week of craw with the uh, first semester freshmen start invoking Gothmer and Verdure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Virginia. Uh, this is my, I don't know if this is uh, too large or anything, but you seem to be inching towards what is needed. in the current selection of our students, not so much here, a good deal here now, but in many other areas where um, there's a profound, <coughs> profound movement away from the mm -hmm. When you say selection, do you mean admissions? Students. Admission, no, I don't mean, what I mean is that students make selection oh. as to yeah, what they're going to pursue. Yeah. Well, again, you know, to, to try to answer that in some global way would be beyond, uh, would be a, a, a very uh, presumptuous <laughs> lack of humility on my part. Um, what, what I can say is that, uh, you know, to speak more concretely, as long as I've been here, the English major never had more than maybe about 25 people declare English majors coming in the door. It was the course we taught first year students that used to convert them. And so, you know, I, I, within my own domain, I think it's extremely important to, to, to teach courses in a way that, that give them that aha experience and say, whoa. You know, I mean, so those of you who know me well know I was two years in college as a chemistry major. You know, imagine that I would be uh, teaching chemistry in, in college. And I love chemistry, it wasn't that I didn't do, but you know, some early great teaching of great works of literature got into my gut. And after a couple of years, I had to admit that that's the way my heart was being pulled. You know? And we, you know, we used to graduate over 100 English majors. Most of them changed in English after this. Now, I think the cultural context within which students come in, the priorities that they have, um, you know, have changed. So it's not simply something internal to us, but I still I still think it depends upon having those powerful experiences. Okay? 
I want to invite you all to continue this conversation up in Hogan Suite A. We have a reception for Jim, and I think there's a lot more conversation to have. And please join me in thanking you.